All right, I think you're going to really um, appreciate uh, tonight's lesson as far as I think it'll be a pretty uh, easy breezy one, just a few new rules to memorize and try to apply. I am going to try to throw a bunch of curveballs at you tonight with some trig identities and really try to disguise some problems. But I think, uh, you know, look at it as a challenge, as a puzzle to be solved, and I think you'll appreciate it, the, the, you know, the journey along the way. But anyway, before I go too much further, there was one thing I should have mentioned in the, last night's video, and it has to do with the power rule. If you recall, we said that the antiderivative for x to the nth power was actually x to the n plus 1 power divided by n plus 1 plus c. Well, there was one exception to that rule. In other words, n was not allowed to equal negative 1. And, it, and I think that's fairly self-explanatory because if n was negative 1, you'd end up dividing by 0, and that's you know not a very legal move in math. Now, so think about what the original function would look like if we were actually trying to, you know, if n was negative 1. They'd be asking you to integrate x to the negative 1 power. So what's the big deal? What's so bad about that? Well, now remember, the integral of 1 over x... So I think we understand why n can't be negative 1 just because of this denominator rule. But, so if the power rule is not allowed to work, how do I integrate this one? Or in other words, what is his antiderivative? I, th I bet you know. I bet you're sitting there right now and you're, t you're screaming at your computer screen that the answer is blank. But I, wanted, I want you to try to think about it on your own. What would the original function have been, in other words, if the derivative function is 1 over x. Can you work backwards and think about who the original would be? That's my challenge to you, and I'll be interested uh, to hear your comments tomorrow to see if you thought that was easy or too tricky. And uh, also, before we go hardcore trig for tonight, I just wanted to review one really, really nice rule that's going to save you a lot of time and energy throughout the year, and that's our rule that we just like to say, make like a beaver and split it up. And so we've got our fun cartoon here to remind us. And I want you to entertain this problem right here. What if I had the quantity x plus 1 divided by radical x, and they wanted me to you know, integrate it or find the antiderivative? Really important that our first move is a non-calculus move. Okay, I'm just going to split the one big fraction into two smaller pieces, and then I'm going to simplify each one by subtracting the exponents and rewriting the second term with a negative exponent. And so... Um, now we're actually ready to integrate, and let's see, what would it be? I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and then again, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Sounds like a broken record, but it gets me to the right answer every time. So we've got a final answer of 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power, plus 2 x to the 1 half power, plus c. And if they wanted to be fussy, and they wanted me to rewrite it with um, in radical form, we could say... Uh, let's see, 2 square root of x cubed, all divided by 3, plus 2 radical x, plus c, and there's a beautiful answer. Okay, I've got some shorthand notation here. I've just got, I threw little d's in front of these trig terms just for derivative, and I want you to hit the pause button right here and just make sure that you can derive these six functions. Um, you know, I, I think we've, we don't see the, you know, cotangent and, you know, cosecant a lot. Um, so let's just make sure we've got those down pat. There's no use going any forward and trying to tackle antiderivatives if we don't first have the derivatives mastered. So go ahead, just challenge yourself, test yourself, see if you really know all of these six by heart. Okay, here's my list and here's what I came up with. Um, I did treat you as... Um, you know, some kind of inner function. So I did finish off my chain rule by putting a du at the end of all of these, and that's just from my chain rule. Now, just a quick question. Did anybody put plus c's at the end of their answers? All right, so um, hopefully you didn't. If you did, you can kind of chuckle at yourself a little bit. Just remember, um, when we're deriving terms, there's no plus c. There's only a plus c when we're integrating or anti-deriving. So, so hopefully you agree with these three. Just remember the other little trick that if the trig function started with the letter c, that you do have a negative on your answer right in here. Um, so just a real quick reminder there. So let's go ahead and let's get ready to integrate now. So we're going to introduce you to six um, examples that kind of play off the derivatives we've done. Uh, first one, what's the antiderivative of the sine function? And we'll just keep everything in terms of x here real short and sweet. You, who would you have to derive to get positive sine? It's actually negative cosine of x plus c is the antiderivative. Uh, number two, what's the antiderivative of cosine? In other words, who
who would you have to derive in order to get cosine for an answer? And that would be positive sine of x plus c. Uh, let's see, number three. Who, let's see, the antiderivative of secant squared. In other words, who would you have to derive in order to get secant squared? And that would be tangent of x. Number four, uh, this might make you think a little bit. Who would you have to derive in order to get positive cosecant squared? You'd have to derive negative cotangent of x in order to get a derivative that was positive. Uh, number five, let's see, the antiderivative of secant x tangent x. Let's see, plus c. Or not plus c, but dx. The um, you would have to derive the secant function in order to get that uh, derivative there. And number six, what's the antiderivative of cosecant x cotangent x? And his antiderivative is negative cosecant x plus c. Remember, if you started with a negative cosecant and you derived him, you'd now have two negatives, thus creating the positive term we have there. Okay, I've got two really basic ones for you to warm up with here. Uh, number one, let's see. What if I wanted to integrate 2 sine of x dx? Now, there was a property the other day that said if you were integrating k times f of x, you were allowed to basically slide that k out and put him on the back shelf as if he didn't exist for a little while. And that's what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to slide the 2 out and I'm going to say to myself, all right, it's two times the antiderivative of sine, which is negative cosine of x plus c. So my final answer would be negative two cosine of x plus c. In other words, what I'm trying to say is by throwing a two right there, it didn't make your job any harder at all. Just let that coefficient come along for the ride. It didn't cause us to use a fancy rule or anything like that. Uh, the other real basic one, let's just try this. Let's try the antiderivative of five secant squared x. In other words, what function would I have had to derive in order to get 5 secant squared as an answer? Again, just pull the 5 out. Um, the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent, and then our constant of integration, so 5 tangent of x plus c. All right, now things from this point on are going to get very interesting, and I think you're going to appreciate the challenge. You've probably been kind of yawning to yourself so far, and, um, and sometimes these challenges bring out the best in us. But I'll tell you what, before we go any further, let's just review a lot of those trig identities that we learned two years ago, and we've seen them creep up on a lot of our bite-sized quizzes. Uh, the first couple I want to talk about are what I call quotient identities. And basically, um, the idea that the tangent of x is really just the sine of x divided by cosine of x, or the idea that cotangent of x could be rewritten as cosine of x divided by the sine of x. So those are the two quotient identities we've seen. Uh, number two, uh, let's talk about the Pythagorean identities. Those are always fun. Um, the godfather, so to speak, is sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Got to have the plus sign in there. Watch out for that. Um, now, there are other variations. You know, we could say, you know, cosine squared equals 1 minus sine squared or, you know, something similar to that. Or we could divide all of these terms by, say, sine squared. And you'd get 1 plus, what would that be, cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. Notice the two functions that you know, start with a C, go hand in hand there in that function. And, or we could go back to the original and divide each term by cosine squared and get uh, tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. Uh, the third variety are the double angles. And we'll probably end our list here. We'll just get the double angles down. There's only one for the sine of 2x. And that would be 2 times the sine of x times the cosine of x. And then there are a variety, there's actually three legal ones for cosine of 2x. Do you remember any of them? Uh, probably the most popular one nowadays in calc is cosine squared minus sine squared. So don't confuse that with the, the godfather of the Pythagorean identities, uh, where you have to have the plus sign. This one, you want to have the minus sign in the middle. A um, couple other variations. We could go 2 cosine squared minus 1, or we could do 1 minus 2 sine squared. And I tell you what, the AP exam is really going to test you on these. And, and this is really the difference between getting a score or of a 4 or a score of a 5. It's just the efficiency of our answers. And if we can make some real slick substitutions early on and make our, you know, our path to our solution that much quicker, we need to do it. 
So how about this for a first feisty one? What if they want us to integrate uh, the tangent of x, cosine of x, in other words, the product of those two trig functions? Let's just use a quotient identity here on the first term times the cosine of x over 1, if you want to emphasize the over 1 part. So really all we're doing is we're integrating the sine of x and the antiderivative of sine of Be careful right here. Yes, the antiderivative is negative cosine of x plus c. And again, emphasize these plus c's. You know, build good habits now so when you hit those quizzes and you're running, you're running as fast as you can, you don't lose those plus c's. All right, we'll try to step up our game here a little bit. Let's integrate the sine of 2x all over for sine of x. Now you'll notice you're not allowed to cancel these signs right now because what's happening is the top function has an angle of 2x and the bottom function has an angle of x. And if those signs don't have the same angle, then they're not like terms and we're not allowed to cancel them. But what you can do is you could rewrite the numerator using your double angle rule and say, okay, 2 sine x cosine x all over 4 sine of x. Now you do have two sine functions with the same angle. Notice we've got an angle of x and an angle of x. So you are allowed to cancel those terms right there. And my new coefficient would be 1 half. The only function left standing is cosine. And his antiderivative, here's the calculus move, 1 half sine of x plus c would be the antiderivative right there. All right, very valuable experience here on this one to go ahead and try to solve this one entirely on your own rather than being a passive bystander. And that's, that's tough to do when you're watching these videos. I know, you just get into a routine of just kind of copying down and trying to listen to everything I said. You know, some of it sinks in, some of it doesn't. But it's really easy to become passive. And here, I want you to grab the bull by the horns. Uh, you know, don't take a back seat. Take the lead here and go ahead and solve this one and then come back and see if we agree. All right, my first move is I identified a double angle in the top up here. And I had three choices. And out of the choices, I went with cosine squared minus sine squared. And what that did is I then saw a difference of two perfect squares in the numerator. So now I factored the numerator. So I've got cosine of x plus the sine of x times the cosine of x minus the sine of x. So I used a double angle substitution, and then I factored it using a difference of two perfect squares. And I always like to emphasize this part. Up until this given moment right here, I have not used one iota of calculus. Okay, So I've simplified the given function, and I'm down to this, cosine minus sine. And it, it's at this moment here where we're actually ready for the first time to do some calculus. And I'm just going to integrate these one term at a time. The antiderivative of cosine is positive sine. And if I integrate negative sine, I'll get positive cosine plus c. And if there's any time where you're staring at your answer and you're wondering, hmm, is this the right answer? I wonder if it's right. Just go ahead and derive that function. You know, pretend that this is y equals. Ask yourself, what would y prime be? It would certainly be cosine minus sine. And, of course, deriving the constant would it, you know, kill the constant. But anyway, it does match what you tried to integrate, and so you're feeling pretty good about your answer. This last one I have for you is the most tenacious one. I love this particular problem. I think it challenges us to not only know our identities, but also be willing to kind of think outside the box and be creative. And so we're going to go with the sine of x and, let's see, 1 minus sine squared on the bottom. Now there, So what catches your attention here? Well, my denominator is factorable. If you want to go ahead and do a difference of two perfect squares, you're not doing anything illegal mathematically. But I do think uh, you, you'd quickly recognize that that leads you to a dead end. So what else could you do? Well, I'm thinking of my Pythagorean identities. All right, I'll make a little note here that this bottom, think of your Pythagorean identities. And what kind of substitution could we make? Isn't that just cosine squared? All right, now here's where the creativity kicks in. Is it legal to rewrite this as the product of two smaller, more innocent fractions. In other words, could I say sine over cosine times 1 over cosine? You know, and at this point, just challenge yourself and ask, is the product of these two equivalent to this one that I started with? And I think we'd quickly agree with yes. All right, I'll simplify that expression a little bit more. Sine over cosine is really tangent. 1 over cosine is really secant. 
And now you've, this matches one of our six rules that we started the day off with. The antiderivative of tangent secant is just secant x. We'll throw our constant on there. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the antiderivative of the function we started with. So not only knowing your identities, but just being create, you know, creative algebraically and you know, express uh, you know, a bigger fraction as the product of two smaller, more innocent ones. So I hope you like them. We'll try to challenge you with some, you know, uh, some other difficult ones tomorrow. We'll make sure we got these six rules memorized. If we don't have those memorized, it's going to be a tough fight tomorrow. Um, but I think otherwise you're going to be in great shape. So keep chugging, and we'll see you tomorrow.